Here are five facts plainly revealed in Holy Scripture and constantly revealed through the book of God which we cherish. These five blessed gospel truths are pillars of our faith, the joy of our hearts, the comfort of our souls, and the constant themes of those songs of praise we sing to our God and of the message preached from this pulpit. Number one, the God we worship, our God, the true and living God, he who alone is God, our Heavenly Father, is absolutely sovereign in all things. He does as he will, always, everywhere. He has his way in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Whatsoever he pleased, that did he in heaven, in earth, and in all deep places. Second, our great sovereign Lord God, before the world began, chose to save a people and predestined all things from eternity, which come to pass in time to accomplish the salvation of those people he loved with an everlasting love. Before the world began, God predestined everything that comes to pass in time exactly as it comes to pass, exactly in the course it takes, using exactly the means he ordained before the world began. And he arranged all things that come to pass in time by his wise order of predestination to save his people from their sins. Third, our Lord Jesus Christ, God's dear Son, our Savior, has effectually redeemed his people from their sins. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, for he was made a curse for us as he hung upon the cursed tree. And he did this that all God's chosen might receive the blessing of Abraham, the promise of the Spirit, life eternal by the power of his grace. Fourth, salvation. This thing we call salvation, the whole of it. The whole of it. Salvation. Everything involved in bringing a sinner from the pit of destruction into the gates of heavenly glory, salvation, is altogether the gift and work of God's almighty grace, received by faith in Christ, without works, without any condition, without any prerequisites, without anything the sinner must meet or do. It is the gift of God. Thank God for free grace. Thank God salvation is his gift, his work, his operation. Nothing depends upon us. And fifth, the Lord our God sovereignly rules, controls, and disposes of all things in providence according to his own holy and wise will. Turn with me, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah 10. Of him, through him, and to him are all things. Therefore we say to him, be glory forever. The Lord God speaks by his prophet in Isaiah 46. You just hold your hands at chapter 10 for a moment. He says, remember the former things of old, for I am God. There is none else. I am God, declaring the end from the beginning. From ancient times, the things that are not yet done saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. He says, I'm God, there's none like me. I declare the end from the beginning. I do all my pleasure. My counsel stands. 
And then he says, let me give you an example. Calling a ravenous bird from the east. And the man that executeth my counsel from a far country. Yea, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. Hearken unto me, ye stout-hearted, that are far from righteousness. I bring near my righteousness. It shall not be far off. And my salvation shall not tarry. And I will place salvation in Zion for Israel my glory. In other words, God does everything exactly as he will, exactly according to his eternal purpose, exactly as he intended from eternity. He is interrupted by nothing. He is never made to pause in his work. He never changes his mind. He never makes adjustments to his purpose. He never reacts. But rather, he does everything exactly as he would. He does everything exactly as he purposed from eternity. Who among us, who among the sons of men, if he were, said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to feed this hungry prophet who's hiding for his life and he's hungry. Who among all the wise men of the world would dream? I'll tell you how I'm going to do that. I'm going to send a raven every day to carry him some food. Who would ever dream of such a thing? God did. He says, I'm going to bring my people who have been in captivity for 70 years back to Jerusalem to build my house, to build my city for the saving of my people. And I'm going to use their sworn enemy to bring them back and build my house. <laughs> who would ever dream of such a thing? God did it. He who is our God is absolutely sovereign. Who among us would ever choose to use evil to accomplish good and choose the evil as the absolutely best way to accomplish the best good. Who? God does. Surely the wrath of man will praise thee, and the remainder of wrath wilt thou restrain. I love Cowper's hymn. I give it to you once more and hope you learn to rejoice in its message. God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessing on your head. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. Yes, the bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. How I proved it. How I proved it. Why can't I believe just a little bit what I know is so? Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind the frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter. And he will make it plain. As God the Holy Ghost enables me, I want to talk to you for a little bit about the providence of God. The title of my message is Understanding Divine Providence. Understanding Divine Providence. I don't mean by that that we can understand 
the intricacies of God's purpose. We understand those things only as God reveals them and we experience them. But we can, if we read this book and are taught of God, we can understand the ways of God in providence, the secret, mysterious, wise, good, sovereign way of God in providence. God the Holy Ghost here in Isaiah 10 gives us an example of God's wise, adorable providence. In this chapter, the Lord God, speaking by his prophet Isaiah, told his chosen people that he would use their Assyrian tormentors, their Assyrian tormentors, those people who despise them. He said, I will use the Assyrians to save my people. And as God used Assyria both to purge his church and cause his elect remnant in Israel to seek him. So the Lord God uses all the events of time for the spiritual, eternal good of his elect. As we read this chapter, we are again reminded of the blessed fact that God the Holy Ghost, in all ages, in all times, in all circumstances, is carrying on his preparatory work in the hearts of chosen, redeemed sinners. In his marvelous, prevenient grace, that is the grace that goes before and lays the foundation for his operations of grace in us. The Lord God uses the events of providence in our lives to plead with chosen, redeemed sinners on account of their sin, and uses those things to hedge about those chosen redeemed sinners. Sweetly, omnipotently, irresistibly forcing them to the Savior. Read the second chapter of Hosea and see how God does it. He said, I will allure you into the wilderness. I'll take away your oil and your wine and your wool and your flax I'll strip you naked before me, and then I'll speak to you. Read the 107th Psalm and see how God hedges about his elect, graciously, irresistibly forcing the sinner he loves into the arms of his Savior. At the time of Isaiah's ministry, Assyria was the greatest economic, political, and military power in the world. Every nation in that part of the world had been or in time would be brought in subjection to the will of the Assyrian Empire. In the eyes of the world, Assyria was an uncontrollable power, a power that had to be obeyed. No one dared stir up the wrath of the Assyrians. No one but a solitary Isolated prophet who believed God. No one, no one dared speak evil of the Assyrians. Isaiah recognized that Assyria was nothing but a tool in the hands of God. A tool by which the Almighty would sovereignly accomplish his eternal purpose. A nation he would destroy when he had finished using the two. Isaiah, you see, didn't see himself living in a world in which men and nations run rampant to accomplish their own pleasure with powerful triumphing over the weak, the ungodly triumphing over the godly, but rather Isaiah saw himself as a man living in a world with a sovereign God at the helm of every nation, on the throne of the universe, Controlling the thoughts, words, and deeds of every man universally. Making even the wicked to serve his purpose. Oh, God make me so to live in this world. In this tenth chapter of his prophecy, Isaiah, writing by inspiration of God the Holy Ghost, teaches us five lessons. Let's look at them together. First, verses one through four. 
Here we learn that the judgments of God, which fall upon individuals and nations in his providence, are always fully deserved. I'm not pausing to wait for something to say. I'm pausing for you to hear what I said. The judgments of God that fall upon individuals and nations. The judgments of God that fall upon entire generations. Are judgments fully deserved by reason of sin. Verse 1. Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees. And that right grievousness which they have prescribed. That's a pretty good description of the entirety of Western civilization in this day. That's a pretty good description of the United States of America. That's an accurate description of those who profess to be God's people in Isaiah's day. Verse 2. To turn aside the needy from judgment and to take away the right from the poor of my people that widows may be their prey that they may rob the fatherless and what will ye do in the day of visitation and in the desolation which shall come from far to whom will you flee for help and where will you leave your glory without me they shall bow down under the prisoners and they shall fall under the slain. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is still is stretched out still. The nation of Israel fell to the Assyrians because they had become a nation like the Assyrians, of idolaters and evildoers. Ungodliness ran rampant throughout the nation. So it is with us. God has sent judgment upon us. Most people don't have enough sense to recognize it. Most preachers don't dare call it what it is. But uh, the diseases by which men and women are being destroyed, AIDS in particular, anybody who thinks it's not the judgment of God on a society because of sodomy is a fool. Blind fool. The earthquakes, hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, famine, war, disease, pestilence. These are the judgments of God in providence upon men who fully deserve them. They are always righteous and just. People say, what did we do to deserve this? Have you got a lifetime for me to tell you? It's not, it's not a wonder to me that you see mudslides and earthquakes and famine and disease and war and pestilence and ungodliness. That's no wonder to me. It's a wonder to me we see so little of it. These things are righteous and just. When God sends judgment upon a people, the fact is both the believer and the unbeliever suffer from the judgment. As he sends rain upon the just and the unjust, so he sends floods upon the just and the unjust. As he sends uh, sunshine on the just and the unjust, the righteous and the wicked, so he sends darkness upon both the righteous and the wicked, the just and the unjust. We live in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, and living in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, clearly under the judgment of God, we must expect to see and experience much pain and heartache. But God's object in judgment is the punishment of the wicked and the preservation of the elect, teaching his own in the midst of great adversity to lean heavily upon the arm of Christ. Tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience as God knocks out from under us those things on which we lean for comfort and support and strength, the unbeliever is destroyed. The believer is cast on a better foundation. Number two, 
in verses 5 through 19. The Lord God shows us that he wisely and graciously uses wicked men without either their knowledge or consent to execute his purpose. Men, you see, all men, are but instruments in God's hand by which he accomplishes his purpose. Isaiah 10, verse 5. O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger, and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. I will send him against an hypocritical nation, and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Howbeit he meaneth not so. That is the Assyrian, he, he doesn't think like this. He, he doesn't think he's doing God's work. Neither doth he think so. But it is in his heart to destroy and to cut off nations, not a few. For he saith, Are not my princes altogether kings? Is not Calno as Carchemish? Is not Hamath as Arpad? Is not Samaria as Damascus? As my hand hath found the kingdoms of the idols, and whose graven images did excel them of Jerusalem and Samaria, shall not I, as I have done unto Samaria and her idols, so do to Jerusalem and her idols. Wherefore, it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his high looks. When I get done with him, he's not going to look so high and mighty. When I get done with him, nobody's going to wonder who's in charge. Verse 13. For he saith, by the strength of my hand, I've done it. And by my wisdom, for I am prudent. And I have removed the bounds of the people. And have robbed their treasures. And have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. And my hand hath found as a nest the riches of the people. And as one gathereth eggs that are left, have I gathered all the earth, and there was none that moved the wing, or opened the mouth, or peeped. That is, I gathered all the eggs, and the hens didn't even move. And the Lord God asked, Shall the axe boast itself against him that heweth therewith? Or shall the saw magnify itself against him that shaketh it? As if the rod should shake itself against them that lifted up. Or as if the staff should lift up itself as if it were no wood. Therefore shall the Lord. I'm talking now about God, the Lord of hosts. Therefore shall the Lord of hosts send among his fat ones leanness. And under his glory shall he kindle a burning like the burning of a fire. And the light of Israel shall be for a fire. And his holy one for a flame. And it shall burn and devour his thorns and his briars in one day. And shall consume the glory of his forest and of his fruitful field, both soul and body. And they shall be as when the standard bearer fainteth. And the rest of the trees of his forest shall be few, that a child may write them. In verses 5 and 6, the prophet tells us that Assyria was nothing but the rod of God's anger. The staff of his indignation by which he executed wrath upon the godless nation. And when he got done with them, he would destroy them. I can remember the day when uh, mom and dad, when they would start to discipline a child, would go get a switch. They would usually make the child get the switch and he better come back with one that was green. And they would wear the child out. And when they got done disciplining the child, they just threw the switch away. They never thought about keeping them. So it is with the Assyrian in this passage of Scripture. 
So it is with all that God uses to chasten his own. The Assyrians thought their cruel, barbaric policies were going to advance their cause. They had met with great success in other places. And the Assyrians' wicked success caused their heads to swell with pride. But God says, When I've accomplished my purpose with Assyria for my people Israel, I will throw them away like a piece of garbage. Look at verses 16 and 17. There's something right in the middle of this passage that ought to be thrilling to our souls. Therefore shall the Lord, the Lord of hosts, send among the fat ones, his fat ones, leanness. And under his glory he shall kindle a burning like the burning of a fire. And the light of Israel, the light of Israel shall be for a fire. And his holy one. The Holy One and the light of Israel are the same person for a flame. And it shall burn and devour his thorns and his briars in one day. We read about our Lord Jesus, the light of Israel. The fire of God, his Holy One. We read about him in Zechariah chapter 3, described in exactly the same way. He enlightens us by his word and by his spirit. He by his almighty grace, effectually calls redeemed sinners out of darkness into his marvelous lights. He is our light, the Holy One. And for us, he is a purifying fire of sanctification. In one day, in one day, he took away the briars and thorns of the curse because he took away our sins when he died at Calvary. And then in one day, he comes in grace to chosen redeemed sinners in the sanctifying power of his spirit and removes from us the briars and thorns of our curse by reason of sin, declaring to us that our sins are put away, purging our consciences from dead works to serve the living God. Understand the prophet's message here and rejoice. God, who is sovereign over all history, is sovereignly working his will in all the events of history. God, who is sovereign over all history, is sovereignly working his will through all the events of history. We must never judge God's goodness by the light of his providence, but rather... Let us judge his providence by the light of his goodness. Turn back to Psalm 92. Let me give you one example as David sings this great, great psalm of praise to our God. Psalm 92. We'll pick up in verse 5. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. A brutish man, the ungodly, the unbeliever, doesn't matter whether he graduated from Harvard, Princeton, or Yale, knoweth not, neither doth the fool understand this. When the wicked spring as the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, there's a reason behind that. It is that they shall be destroyed forever. But thou, Lord art most high forevermore. For lo, thine enemies, O Lord, for lo, thine enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. But my horn shalt thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. I'm going to turn out to this day better than it was when I went into it. Mine eye also shall see my desire on mine enemies. And my ears shall hear my desire of the wicked that rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing to show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, 
and there is no unrighteousness in him. All right, back here in Isaiah 10. Look at verses 28 through 23. Here's the third thing. The object of God's providence. The object of God's providence. It's singular. The object of God's providence is the everlasting good of his elect. The object of God's providence is the everlasting good of his elect. I said back in the office to the men, when I was a young man, I used to be away from home a good bit. And uh, Shelby and I were first married. We lived on the south side of Winston-Salem. And I'd go different places to preach. A lot of times she had to stay at home. And I'd come home. And from Mount Airy, North Carolina, to where we lived in Winston-Salem, it was 36 miles. It didn't matter whether I'd driven 200 miles or 1,000 miles. When I got south of Mount Airy, that 36 miles seemed like the longest piece of road you could drive. I was going home. And I couldn't get home quick enough. And as we are making our pilgrimage through this world, children of God, we're going home. And the closer we get to home, the longer the road seems. Understand this all along the way. Understand this, God help you to understand this, all along the way. No matter what bumps we meet with in the road. No matter what obstacles, no matter how Satan may roar, no matter how men may oppose. No matter what ungodliness we may see and experience by the hand of God's providence from wicked men and wicked governments. The object of God's providence is the everlasting good of his elect. Let's see if that's not what he says in verse 20. And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped to the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon him that smote them. They'll quit trusting the Assyrian but shall stay upon the Lord the Holy One of Israel in truth. <laughs> oh my God, take from me everything in which I trust but you. And let me learn to trust you alone. The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, Return where? Unto the mighty God. For though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return. The, con the consumption is decreed. The consumption decreed shall overflow. What? The consumption shall overflow with righteousness. For the Lord the God of hosts shall make a consumption even determined in the midst of all the land. In every age, there is a remnant, according to the election of grace, who must and shall be saved. It was true in Isaiah's day, and it's true in our day. And everything God does, directly and indirectly, everything God does that's obvious, outward and open, and everything God does that's secret and hidden, Everything that's plainly revealed and those things that are not revealed. Everything is worked by God for the saving of his elect. Why does God send his church through trials and troubles and difficulties of providence to times of judgment? Why? Why does God deal with his people like he does in this world? He sent the Assyrians to invade and conquer Judah. The church of God in this world has lived through ages of persecution. Peoples all over the world are ruled by communists, ruled by dictators who are mean, barbaric, and cruel, ruled by 
religious darkness. We see civil strife constant in our streets. It gets worse all the time. Rampant ungodliness. Who could ever imagine? We, when, when I was a boy, when you were boys and girls, you, you couldn't even imagine. You, you couldn't even imagine someone speaking in public about things that you read about, you, children talk about every day. You, you couldn't even imagine folks talking about it in public. Why? Why? He does these things for the purging of his church. They are not all Israel which are of Israel. By these things he separates the precious from the vile, the sheep from the goats, and the wheat from the tares. He does the things he does for the spiritual maturity of his saints to teach us to lean upon Christ and for the salvation of his elect that he might gather his elect from afar. Number four. Look at verses 24 through 26. God's saints in this world, even in the most troublesome times, have no cause for alarm or fear. God's saints in this world, even in the most troublesome times, have no cause for alarm or fear. Verse 24, Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, O my people that dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. He shall smite thee with a rod, and shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt. He's, he's going he's to cause you to smart. He's going to give you some pain, some trouble, some trouble of body, of mind, of heart, and soul. For yet a very little while, just, just give it a day or two, and the indignation shall cease, and mine anger in their destruction. And the Lord of hosts shall stir up a scourge for him, according to the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. And as the rod was upon the sea, so shall he lift it up after the manner of Egypt. He says, uh, remember... Remember what I did in the days of Gideon? Remember? Remember what I did back yonder when I brought you out of Egypt? Do you remember how my people looked back over the sea and saw Pharaoh and his armies dead on the shore and gathered up all that they needed for 40 years from the enemy laying on the shore? So it shall be with you again. I will yet turn this to your good and your benefit. Our Savior put it to us this way. The very hairs of your head are all numbered. You don't have anything to be afraid of. Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. You see... Our troubles here won't last long. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And the Lord God, our Savior, will deliver us just as he always has delivered his people at the appointed time when it is most beneficial for us. One last thing, verses 27 through 34. In the end, God will destroy all his enemies and ours and save his people by his almighty grace. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder. That Assyrian rod feels real heavy. That heartache is so hard to bear. That trouble so difficult to endure. And it's going to come to pass. I'm going to lift the burden up, take it away. And the yoke shall be destroyed because of what? Because of what? Because of the anointing. Because you're mine. Because you're Christ. 
Because you've been called by God and made his born again by his spirit. He has come to Aeth. He has passed to Migrant. At Michmash, he hath laid up his carriages. They are gone over the passage. They have taken up their lodging in Geba. Ramah is afraid. Gibeah of Saul is fled. Lift up thy voice, O daughter of Galen. Cause it to be heard unto Laish. O poor Anathoth. Madmina is removed. The inhabitants of Gibeah gather themselves to flee. As yet he shall remain at Nob that day. He shall shake his hand against the mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. Behold the Lord. I'm talking about God now. I'm not talking about some peanut. I'm not talking about some idol. I'm talking about God. Behold, the Lord of hosts, God who controls everything and everybody, shall lock the bow with terror, and the high ones of stature shall be hewn down, and the haughty shall be humbled. And he shall cut down the thickets of the forest with iron. And Lebanon shall fall by a mighty one. Now, just exactly what is it that should cause us fear? Just exactly what is it that should weigh so heavily upon our souls and cause us not to believe God? What? What? Cast all your care on him. He cares for you. And he knows how to deliver the righteous out of temptation, out of trouble. And uh, the trouble... The trouble, whatever it is, Oh, bless God, whatever it is will soon be over. And when it's over, you'll say, thank you, Lord. You've done everything exactly as I wanted it. Exactly as it ought to be. To the good of your people and the glory of your name. Amen.